Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Uh, welcome to this presentation uh, between HashiCorp and a number of our customers and partners, um, which we're billing as a virtual strategy day because we're not going to be talking low-level technology, but rather more conceptually today uh, about a very important subject, which probably could not be higher up the agenda globally with every uh, government and with every um, uh, large-scale enterprise, and that is that of zero trust security, otherwise known sometimes as perimeterless security. Um, quick introduction to myself before I, I walk you through the agenda. Uh, my name is Laurie McLaughlin. Uh, I'm the head of UK and Ireland sales here at HashiCorp, and I've been with the company almost four years now. Uh, and in that time, we have uh, certainly had uh, a number of conversations with customers about, about this very topic, uh, mainly because all of our products uh, kind of uh, sit squarely in this, in this space. We have um, a packed agenda today, so I'm not going to be talking for, for too long. Um, the first person to, to speak after me will be Guy Sayer, who's our field uh, chief technology officer uh, in EMEA. Uh, he's going to be talking about you know, what is zero trust security and also techniques on, on how to, to implement that. Uh, we're then going to uh, switch into a short presentation by, by Raj from, from NatWest, uh, one of our, our largest customers, uh, who's um, also going to do a little Q&A with, with Guy as well uh, to talk through uh, their perspectives on Zero Trust. Uh, following that, we're going to hear from Chris Story, who works for uh, DWP, and he's going to tell us uh, how DWP are tackling this, uh, this large topic. And then uh, on to uh, Siva from uh, one of our largest cloud partners, AWS, who's going to give uh, their perspective on it. Uh, lastly, we're going to uh, hear from uh, Nico Correo, who runs our uh, field engineering team in EMEA, and he's going to be talking to you more specifically about how HashiCorp products align uh, with Zero Trust. And then we'll just round off, uh, finishing off at uh, half past 11. Now, we are uh, recording this session, so we hope you can stay with us for uh, the full length of the session. But if you do have to drop, uh, you can obviously uh, pick this up afterwards. Uh, and since we have a packed agenda, and because there's a large number of people on this webinar, uh, we'll be taking questions and, and trying to answer those in the in the chat window. So if you just look at the, the Q&A box, uh, as indicated here, you can ask any questions that you have. So as I mentioned before, uh, HashiCorp's products all sit very much in this uh, brave new world of, of zero trust, of multi-cloud and of hybrid infrastructure. Uh, many of you may know um, HashiCorp more for the products, in fact, than the name HashiCorp, where particularly our Terraform, Vagrant Packer, and perhaps Vault products. Uh, but also we have a number of other very exciting products uh, on the way, uh, including um, Waypoint and Boundary. Uh, and we have uh, products such as Console, which um, very much are uh, looking at how you can secure applications and create uh, zero trust environments. Uh, HashiCorp uh, over the last sort of um, four years in particular has, has massively grown. Uh, really with the advent of the enterprise versions of, of our products. Uh, we now have globally well over a thousand enterprise customers, including seven of the uh, top 10 fortune companies and eight of the 10 top global financial institutions. And as that translates to the UK, uh, we're now around about 70 people. Um, we have over a hundred enterprise customers just in the UK and Ireland alone. And that actually includes all of the, the top 10 financial institutions. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into the main topic of the day. And I'd like to hand over to Guy Sayer, who's going to talk to us about what is Zero Trust Security and how to implement it. Thank you, Laurie. Let's just start my share here. Hi, everybody. I'm Guy. Uh, thanks for inviting me today to talk about Zero Trust. Um, I'm going to start with you know this slide. Laurie kind of covered it in today's session. We are zooming in on Vault, Boundary, and Console, and we'll see how, how they are used to implement Zero Trust. We'll start with a little bit of uh, settings, what is changing due to multi-cloud in, in the context of security and trust, and then how Boundary, Console, and Vault are used to implement Zero Trust. All right, so the, the, first, um, the first thing I want to talk about 
is the fact that securing traditional on-prem data center was easy, quote unquote, you know, we should probably say sufficient and not easy. Um, and the focus on uh, securing, you know, what we call the, the, the perimeter, right? The castle and moat. Um, and the, the model is that if you secure the, the perimeter for the data center, you kind of create a, a, a feel of anyone that is outside of the data center is bad and inside the data center is good and trusted, right? And in this model, the entire focus is on controlling the ingress, the entry to the data center. And that is done with firewalls and WAFs and other C middlewares or whatever else. And sometimes also deploying multiple network perimeters with reduced functionality and all that to basically make sure that bad actors are kept away from our core network and trusted data centers. And that was possible, we could do that because we had full control over the physical layers, the building, the network gear, the infrastructure, everything else up to the connectivity and the entry point into the data center, right? And in, 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 that, um, in that kind of model, application teams also grew and learned to treat security as someone else's problem, right? There's a different team that runs in parallel to the application team and they will secure the perimeter, they will secure the environment, right? And if you take it even further in that relationship between application and security, when applications went through security checks, cyber controls, usually at the very end of the process, they sometimes looked at the findings, looked at the rejects and quote unquote, accepted the risk, right? So that, you know, we don't introduce delays to the process and we'll come back to deal with these findings later, almost like, technical debt. And that was all okay, right? It was all okay because we fundamentally accepted that securing the perimeter was sufficient, right? Once the perimeter is secure, the data center is secure, the network is trusted. And with that model, it's okay for application teams and infrastructure to be less strict about security. And then came cloud and basically flipped this entire model on its head. And I wanna talk about, uh, I wanna talk about why. And there are many aspects that change when we look at infrastructure and application stacks when we operate in multiple cloud environment. In the context of zero trust and security, I wanna call out three main changes. <clears throat> the first is that with cloud, and even more so when you're operating in multiple cloud, the network is a logical construct, right? It's no longer a physical network that you control. We don't own the network gear. We don't configure the firewalls and everything else. We connect logical networks, overlay networks with, you know, fat pipes and whatever else to create one logical enterprise network that spans environments and physical networks. So now let's layer cloud adoption into that network transition and transformation will end up with some applications and core infrastructure that will forever remain on-prem, <clears throat> some that will be refactored and migrated to cloud, and typically net new applications that operate in the cloud from day one. And then all of a sudden, we have this need for connectivity and access from cloud environments, cloud networks, public internet, to our very own secured and trusted network, right? That's something that um, really changed how we think about the um, the, net, the physical versus virtual network. The second thing is the, the change of focus, right? And moving um, to be developer oriented, right? The focus on self-service, agility, developer experience. So traditionally cyber teams were a gatekeeper in this workflow of application delivery. Usually, as we said, at the, at the very end of the, of the, of the process. Cyber teams are transitioning, transitioning to being enablers, right? So they um, they kind of you know sit alongside the application team. We call that the shared responsibility model. In that model, cyber teams define and manage policies and governance, and then they kind of move out of the way, logically speaking, for application teams to implement and comply with. Right. So now cyber are not there to gate and control the process and the environment is less safe, 
So we need to figure out how to make application teams and applications themselves more aware of security so that we don't, uh, we don't increase risk overall. And the, the last point is that the attack vectors really change, right? And traditionally, you know, this notion of anyone that is on the network that has passed all the controls is something, is someone that we can trust. They can access, generally speaking, anything on the network. We're now in a model where we assume, um, we assume bad intent. We do not trust services, application processes, humans on the network just because they are there. Every interaction needs to start with, you know, some sort of uh, uh, authentication and authorization so that we know who we are dealing with. And I'm going to now talk about um, the three main things that we see as, uh, as how to adapt to this new environment, right, to the new security model. Uh, first and foremost, and this is kind of the overarching story of this entire presentation, is that we move from uh, we move away from um, physical network identity and network controls to logical service identity and application and service controls, right? And that is because, you know, as we said before, we connect nightly for networks. We have overlapping ad IP addresses. <clears throat> Some technology stacks will hide and change and patch IP addresses, right? If it's a NAT or a modern Kubernetes cluster or whatever else. So we can no longer trust the IP address as an identity for a service or for a process. So we need to move away from IP to something else, something higher level, right? Think of service identity that is then uh, used to manage um, access and authorization at the service level. And then when realized with physical IPs, then these rules and policies don't need to change and update, right? Um, and basically we kind of use that to make sure that if you are on the network, you don't get access to anything. Um, you, you, know, you need to first establish your, your, uh, your identity and prove who you are. The next thing I want to talk about is the, how we manage secrets, right? So traditionally, at the far end of the spectrum, we started with hard-coded username and passwords in source files and config. That still happens, less so. And then um, in the far end of the spectrum, think about the Nirvana state where, you know, credentials are, are, um, are ephemeral. They are one-off credentials, right? So think about an API key that is created on demand and once used, it's completely useless. So there's no way to compromise it. So, you know, we are no long, we are not there yet, but this move from static, well-known, um, hard-coded username, password keys to something that is created on demand and ephemeral, right? This is in the same way that workloads and infrastructure, they're all ephemeral, so should the identities and credentials be. And the last point is the data protection, right? The encryption. And, um, you know, think about the traditional model, the traditional tools that we use to encrypt. Um, let's use transparent disk encrypt, for example. These were used to protect from a physical breach to a data center, right? Someone physically gets hold of the, of the, of the disk and, you know, you'd not be able to, to read the data. But in the, in the new model, in the new zero trust setup, <clears throat> when we assume attackers are on the network, logically speaking, not physically in the data center, in the same way that transparent disk encrypt encrypts the data, if you access this data through the application or through a database, it will happily transparently decrypt the data. So we need to think about something else and uh, you know, have, uh, have that encryption flow be elevated to the application level, right? So we want the application to read, write, and transmit encrypted data and do all the decryption and transformation in memory. So there's no way, uh, there's no way to access the data physically or logically through the network without going through the, uh, that application. Okay, so we kind of talked a little bit about the theory, where we are, things that are changing and how to move on and adapt to the new cloud, to the new model. 
Next, I'm going to cover our approach, HashiCorp's approach to zero trust, focusing on, on this area, the data center as an application, and you know, kind of look at how Vault, Console, and Boundary are used to implement uh, zero trust. I'll start with um, I'll start with the edges. I'll talk about identity, the authentication, authorization, and then I kind of move on into access. And we break the problem into four different workflows. I'll walk through each of the each of the each of the areas. The overarching principle here is to move from IP-based controls to identity-based controls. Right, this is the single most important point of this uh, of this talk of this presentation. And you'll see that we implement machine to machine differently. We use different tools uh, to human to machine. And while the requirement is the same at the high level, you'll see that you know when you get to the details, we'll need to use those uh, different workflows to to solve these these challenges differently. All right. So I'll start with um, I'll start with authentication authorization for um, user to machine. Right, and um, this is you know this is really where we want to establish an identity for uh, for an individual. Right, and this is something that has been kind of evolved over the over in recent years, and there's been a move to a centralized management of identities uh, and the introduction of a single sign-on between systems. And so, typically, a user journey starts with authentication against some uh, LDAP or Active Directory or Kerberos. And then data identity is carried to the target venue, target platform, target cloud with systems like Okta, Ping, or other SSA, SSO provider. In a way, there's not much that changed here from our perspective with cloud. We just kind of use that model and piggyback on it. So then I'll go to the far end and talk about the machine-to-machine um, -machine authentication authorization, and this is where we use Vault. Vault is our fun foundational security product, and there are three main use cases that it addresses and solves. The first, the first one is the uh, central secret management. I think about it as a as a central wallet for uh, managing secrets. Typically, usually starting with static secrets, right? So we said earlier, you kind of move from hard coded code and config, put them in the wallet. They're still static, and then you know, gradually you move to dynamic and ephemeral uh, secrets and identity. The second and third are about data protection, data encryption. Uh, and this is where we want to elevate encryption and data protection from the infrastructure and being done transparently to the application. So if Vault sits there and the application communicates with Vault to encrypt, transform, uh, tokenize, and other mumbo jumbo stuff that you would want to do with the data so that it's persisted in a way that it's completely useless unless you read it and go back through the, the encryption in, in Vault, right? Um, so Vault kind of in the, in the context of, uh, of zero trust, the guiding principle for Vault is this ident notion of identity brokering. If you think of a microservices setup, you know, we have more and more applications, more and more systems, more and more platforms that we need to interact with. And there's a, an inflation of identities and secrets that we need to manage. Uh, so this is where applica applications start with a well-known identity, authenticates against Vault. And then with policy-based and role-based enforcement, Vault will broker identities and create ephemeral identities and credentials in, in, in target, um, in target ed endpoints. Right? So you kind of like hide all that interaction and creation and deletion of identities and secrets, uh, you hide that with Vault, delegate it to Vault rather than hide. All right, so then we know who we are. <clears throat> um, and then we want to start interacting between services and we want to make sure that the access is secure. This is where we use, uh, we use Vault, for, uh, we use console for that. Um, console is a network, so networking solutions or service networking solutions, right? And it's used to automate network workflows in a secure way across any cloud, any technology stack. 
a little bit on console, right? So it solves three main use cases and, and you can think about them. Generally speaking with our products, we have this notion of crawl, walk, run to help teams and organizations to start with simple and then enhance and advance as you, um, as you progress with your journey. With console, the very first one is a holistic service discovery with health view, right? So think about it as a central registry that holds up-to-date location and health status of services and applications that are deployed and then exposes it as a DNS view, for example, um, or um, there's some sort of a time-based feed to extract from console to a CMDB that is slower moving and ticket-based. So you kind of start with service discovery, health status, and you know remove the CMDB updates, workflow, and tickets. Next, next use case is uh, service mesh. With service mesh, really, we, <clears throat> we decentralize the security and indirection functions of the network, right? So security firewall, indirection load balancer, traditionally done <clears throat> with appliances. Now we decentralize them and do them at the edges on the network. And console enforces the, uh, the security with mutual TLS for inter, intra-cloud, inter and intra-application uh, access, right? And the third use case is the network infrastructure automation, in short, NIA. And then this is where console, uh, we talked about the decentralizing the network. It sounds great. Um, it works, but the reality is that those appliances, those heavy slow moving appliances are there to stay for the, um, for the next foreseeable future. <clears throat> so when you think of the last mile of automation, this is where console either directly with a feed, as we said earlier, with CMDB or NA5, or indirectly through Terraform completes the last mile of, uh, of network provisioning, right? So when there is an event, proactive or reactive event, we need to introduce additional capacity, failover, change the net, the physical network. Console will then broker um, and flow the updates through Terraform to the network, to traditional network devices, right? So we decentralize, but we also are aware of the of the centralized model that needs to be updated, and we call it the, the last mile in a way. So to summarize, uh, console the, uh, the the, the, the guiding principle for console in the context of zero trust is the application-based networking, right? And we move away from updating, configuring at the IP layer, IP configuration. We move, we, we move that to service and application that is then realized when, uh, when IP is available. All right, so last, I'm gonna talk about the use, uh, human to machine access. And this is typically a break class or some maintenance, right? It's not a BAU flow and something that just exists all the time. It's just something that you need to create to facilitate um, a session, a time session or an on-demand session. <clears throat> For human to machine access, we use Boundary. It's a new tool, right? It's a new tool that is available as an open source. And it presents a modern way to automate and protect access to applications, infrastructure, and endpoints. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about Boundary. I'm gonna start with kind of take a step back because it's a new product. I wanna walk through the, you know, what we call the traditional approach, traditional workflow for implementing human access. And then kind of talk about the challenges here and you know, how, how Boundary came to life, right? So let's say that the human needs to access a resource uh, sitting outside of the, of the network, of the corporate network. Right, so the very first thing you want to do is access the VPN or connect to the VPN. <clears throat> Usually you would have some sort of physical device, RSA key or biometric key, uh, YubiKey, that needs to be distributed for onboarding. It needs to be collected safely for offboarding. It's a heavy process, slow moving, costly and, and risky. risky. Right, the next thing is once we've gone through the VPN, the user is now on the corporate network, which is fine because that's what we want. We want to access the network. But then again, in a zero trust 
context where we don't trust actors. We don't want people going around the network and doing stuff, right? So we want to um, reduce that notion of having access to the entire network. The next step is going through the security gate. This is typically IP-based, right? It'll be a firewall or a jump host or IP tables somewhere that allow access to the specific resource. And the, the challenge there is that as the network changes, IP addresses introduced because of failover and scaling event and whatever else, these, um, these gates need to be updated and we are back to workflows with tickets um, and long provisioning times. And then the last part is the actual access to the resource. And so you need to be known as a user, you need to be known at the resource and you need to have some sort of credentials that you keep to access it. Or if you're using a shared identity, then you know, like all the governance and audit kind of goes out of the window. Uh, so this is another risk point that we want to reduce, right? Not having uh, to manage and expose identities and credentials to our resources. So then let's look at how uh, how we do it with uh, with boundary and like you know reduce reduce friction, but also improve also improve the security overall. If you think of the of the traditional model, it's not it's not wrong. It was just designed for you know high trust and slow moving environment, right? And now we are in a low trust, fast moving environment, right? Low trust. It's not our network. We don't trust individuals or systems. And then we want this notion of you know speed, developer experience, time to market. How do we do both both of these things together, right? So um, the first is the the single sign-on, right? We talked about it earlier with access. So we just integrate with single sign-on providers. There's no VPN or no devices or onboarding or offboarding that is required for the user to gain access. Right? It's the same same old single sign-on platform. The next thing, once past this, the 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 login, the user would be. Uh, presented with a list of resources that they have, they are allowed to access based on the role, based on you know various policies, the location, the time of day, whatever else. And this is a logical list that keeps updating with the reality. Right. So think about the, a feed from Terraform or when things change on Kubernetes, this list would would be updated. You don't need to go and touch it; it's automatically updates itself from from the reality. So then the next. The next thing is that Boundary will create uh, a connection, direct connection between the user workstation to the resource. Like think about it as an SSH tunnel on steroids, and there's no way for the user to access, see, touch anything else on the network on the way any host or any other devices, right? It's just a, a ded dedicated connection. And then the last part is um, presenting the user on demand and creating ephemeral presence with credentials for the user to access the the, the, the required resource um, for that you know for that duration with the right DTLs and whatever else. And then when the session is complete, this whole flow is just collapsed, deleted, the credentials are removed from the database from, from the resource. Session is removed. The network is destroyed. Network connection is destroyed, and there's no way to exploit that uh, that setup. Stepping out and kind of looking at boundary from the high level, <clears throat> this is the workflow that it implements. Like we talked earlier, authorization with uh, uh, an identity provider, typically on-prem, and then we kind of carry that that identity to authorize with a single sign-on provider. And the last part is that Boundary negotiates and integrates with Vault to broker and create that ephemeral identity and credentials to satisfy the session. All right, so I'll summarize. We talked a little bit about traditional approach and what changed with cloud and then how to implement zero trust with, uh, with HashiCorp tools, right? We touched about Vault, console, Boundary, and we integrate with single sign-on providers. And we saw different ways to implement zero trust for machine to machine versus human to machine. But the overarching principle here is that the move from identity, network identity 
to logical service and application identities and control. And that's me. Um, thank you, and I'll talk with you later. Back to you, Laurie. Guy, thank you very much indeed. Uh, very, very interesting to hear just how you know the world has changed, how cloud has flipped, you know, the traditional uh, perimeter-based security on its head, uh, and also nice to see how you know the Azure Corp products uh, fit into uh, this this new model. Uh, you know, Guy talked there about uh, Vault, uh, to also talked about Console, which are two existing uh, products that have been around for a long time, both of which have uh, enterprise versions, which help to, I guess, address the challenges of scale, of governance, um, and of collaboration. Uh, Boundary is a new product, uh, and it's already available in its open source version. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, uh, please you know, feel free to look at the, the, the website or, or to put a, a question in chat, and we'll gladly follow up uh, offline or, or online with you. Um, going into the next part of the agenda, um, I'd like now to hand over to, um, uh, well, Guy will be involved again, but hand over to, to, to Raj from that West Group. Uh, and Raj is going to talk through uh, how he sees the world and how NatWest Group, uh, I'm sure, see the world. So over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just set up a quick screen share. So we're going to do things slightly differently as well. Um, we've got a presentation to go through, and then obviously there's the, the Q&A with the guy as well. So let's just quickly start the screen share. Um, I thought it might be worth just going through what NatWest uh, see as, obviously, where we are today, why Zero Trust is important to us. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to articulate that through the video. Um, but what we kind of want to show here is obviously NatWest has been a traditional bank for many years. Um, you know, what we're trying to articulate here is that you've got a bank that was pretty set in its way relating to what the services that we provide to our customers. And that was with all of our data within premise. And that meant, you know, similar to what Guy was referring to, um, you know, our security teams were comfortable with this. Um, you know, we had maintenance of all of our data, the way our applications were working. We only had a single ingress in for our, you know, our applications. Um, and within, within the perimeter itself, uh, we had, let's say, segregation of our networks. So that meant that we've had things like, you know, what our developers network would look like, where our applications would be hosted, but that was all within our control. And obviously, you know, trying to move forward, um, the security concerns were, well, if this is all in our control, we understand the things like authentication, the authorization, the data is within our control. We understand who's using it. And also, you know, uh, from a financial perspective, our regulators are comfortable with that sort of design. Um, but obviously going forward, um, I think, uh, you know, Guy touched upon this, is uh, we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the whole new concept of the way that the industry is moving towards right around cloud is we're still a traditional bank as we're showing here, um, but we're starting to move a lot of our, you know, infrastructure, our applications towards SaaS providers to, you know, PaaS and IaaS. And, you know, these are multiple providers. So this will be things like, you know, ServiceNow, you might have things like the Office 365 for Microsoft. And then obviously you've got the traditional VMware, AWS. Um, and I think the, obviously the other one was Azure. Um, and that meant that obviously, you know, the concept of, you know, trying to grow our data centers is actually, we don't want to do that anymore. Um, and because our applications are within our data center, they were in our control, but that wouldn't scale. So if we're trying to extend our network to, you know, these providers, additional providers, we needed to understand exactly how we would do that in terms of integrating them into our ecosystem. Um, and what we wanted to avoid, obviously, from a scaling perspective is let's build, you know, uh, monolithic applications like we did in the past, but start moving towards those concepts around microservices. And we started doing that, obviously, over the last few years, um, you know, we're just breaking down applications from, you know, whatever functions they provide to simple microservices. Um, that was part of the journey. But one of the main things we had to do was also continue providing services to, you know, our, our customers. So we still need to be able to provide people the ability to do things like mobile banking, transfer the um, you know, money around, um, but our data and services were all moving towards the cloud environment. And that introduced a potential risk for us if we were to maintain our current networks the way they were, um, you know, purely from a cyber criminals perspective. And I think, you know, again, Guy mentioned this, um, if we were to completely federate all of our applications, cyber criminals would absolutely love this because we've got this flat network. 
And if it's all opened up where, you know, each microservice can communicate with different microservices or different application points, it becomes, if one application gets compromised, our network gets compromised and our apps get compromised. That means obviously from the you know, perspective of our customers, they might not be able to get the services they need. <clears throat> so moving towards things like the um, zero trust model, um, we need to make sure that our applications will, you know, extended into these perimeters because of scalability, but we then came up with the idea, obviously, you know, similar to the industry, is like, okay, what do we need to do to create a security perimeter where we've got our applications that are federated across multiple cloud providers? This is kind of what this is showing. But we create the zero trust model, which is, you know, ensuring that these applications can only communicate with what they needed to. Um, and the idea being some of the principles we have in place, which is similar to the industry, is, you know, we never want to trust an application, right? So any application needs to be authorized to be able to communicate with something, which means we must always verify that this app should talk to app, you know, B, for example. Um, to enable this to scale, we need to do things like network automation. Um, you know, you couldn't do this manually. And obviously to do that, we needed orchestration. So that's purely to do with things like the developer experience that, um, that we all want to make sure is, is there. But this meant people like, um, you know, people were not trusted. Um, within the organization. So a developer might not have access to the applications. Devices externally would need to be authorized. Our cloud provider applications would all need to be authorized in a specific way. And it was that principle that even our applications had to go down this model. And this was kind of the design that we wanted to make sure that with this concept, this was ensuring that when our applications are secured, we can actually scale it so that we've got the ability to allow our developers to continue to create you know, microservices functions and so on, but also to ensure that whether they're being deployed within the network or in a secure manner that actually they're only getting access to what they need to. And it has been, it's gone through some sort of life cycle to validate and test. Um, so that was like a, a quick overview. Um, Guy, we've got some questions that we wanted to go through. So if I stop sharing, um, we can go through some of those. Yeah, domains. thanks, Raj. That, that, that's great. I like the, I like the drawing. Right, it kind of, uh, it's the it's the closest thing to a whiteboard that you could do. Well, slightly different um, presentations. Yeah, <clears throat> like it. So really, Raj, I wanted to ask you. Um, thanks for kind of touching on these points that I mentioned. But you know, there's this. So I we we draw a picture and we talk a little bit about the theory and where you know we are going in as an industry. And I want like to bring that to today and ask you like in your you know from your experience what are the biggest challenges and also think about changing the wheels as the bus drives right i mean you don't stop to implement zero trust the bank needs to keep operating and serve clients and introduce new flows and new requirements new regulations you know the, this executive order that just came from the us i think you know i i think the uk will follow suit sometime soon so you know kind of what what are your perspectives on implementing as you go and the challenges of, of doing it? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So obviously, you know, NetWest Group is a, a large enterprise, right? So we're not a startup organization where we've already got a very established, you know, uh, network perimeter, you know, applications that are out there that provide services to our, to our customers. Um, we can't just lift and shift that. So one of the challenges, obviously, we want to implement a zero trust. So like you said, it's like, a, you know, we're, we're designing it as we go, but we're also migrating. So net new applications, for example, would move towards the zero trust, but we need to make sure that we can extend our existing network. So, you know, we're never going to be in a situation where we're going to say to a customer, here's your application that might sit on prem. Let's go and redevelop that all within a couple of months and move that towards, say, the cloud environment. You know, they need to understand how they break down their application to, to microservice, for example. They need to ensure that the services that they provide are continuing. Um, but then we want to make sure that we can scale. So it's a it's a it's a complex journey, um, but it is something that we are undertaking because this it, we know that this is somewhere that we need to move towards. You know, if we want to bring in scalability and be competitive in the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know. I think you're saying like there's no one one size fits no one, right? I mean, you need to right. classify applications and kind of take different actions based on the application trajectory. Absolutely. Some that will just eventually, you know, die quote unquote on prem and some that will be refactored and yeah yeah, uh, yeah. And, and that's a that's a fairly complex process for for our teams you know should we deprecate should we um you know build net new those sort of concepts yeah yeah and you know what what what's your experiences with you know kind of like the cyber moving out of the way you know as i call it right moving from this shared responsibility model and scaling the scaling and automating the cyber controls and, and workflows it's, it's a change of mentality. 
So, you know, you have got um, this concept, which is, you know, we've got a set process, we need to stick to it, you know, we, we shouldn't scale too quick, so on. But, you know, for me, behavior changes have to come with technology changes, right? So when you've got things like all these new capabilities with cloud, um, obviously there's tools that obviously, you know, actually got provide a number of tools that can help make that journey easier. Um, but you have to embrace this, right? And, you know, if, if you're not going to embrace it and take the old mentality to new, you, you know, we're all going to struggle. So you, we've got to understand, okay, how do we bring the right tools in to help support us move towards this new, new way of thinking? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, you know, it's the, the best set of tools, but really it, the, the transformation transition is far greater than the tools and technology, right? It's a, it's a culture and organizational change. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, you know, my last question is about COVID. Right, because like we're doing this over Zoom, partly because of COVID. Yes. How how did you how do you see COVID impacting? It impacts the bank in many many ways, but specifically in the in the context of uh, of trust and cloud and zero trust. So uh, yeah, COVID is a big topic at the moment, isn't it? But um, it's been an un, un, un sort of certain year. So obviously from the previous year, not knowing uh, what was going on, not being able to plan as well as we probably have done in the past. Um, uh, that's purely because, you know, one, we're adopting remote working, like you've just mentioned. Um, we've got many, many employees that are currently working at home. And obviously, you know, we're slowly starting to open up, which is great because it's good to see that there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel but it still leaves a level of uncertainty because obviously there's things like the variants, but from our perspective, we've had to slow down a little bit, right? Uh, and that's purely because we wanna make sure that our staff are comfortable, we're not pressurizing them because working in isolation at home, sometimes, you know, some people might have, you know, a different situation compared to others. We've had to accommodate and um, we've had to slow down the journey a little bit, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not implementing this. So for example, you know, getting the right message across remotely uh, trying to articulate things through visual representation like the video that we just showed you, um, things like designs, uh, prototypes, concepts. We're having to do that more now as opposed to when you're in the office and the ability to sit down with, you know, security, your cell, you know, engineers and actually design something. You can do that together, you know, you collaboratively do that in an office. But when you're working a little bit remotely, for us, it's a learning curve because we never did that before. We had one or two days maybe, but not, you know, five days a week, everyone at home, constantly on Zoom and so on. So it, it's, it's been a challenge, um, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's not something where we're, we're causing to stop our IT security model. We want to move towards zero trust. Our ambition is still to move towards obviously the cloud. Um, and we're working with a number of engineers to understand how we can improve that collaborative working to move towards zero trust, but also bring in, like I said, the tools to help us do it easier as opposed to implementing ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and this is consistent, you know, it's consistent with what we see with other clients, but it's also consistent, my experience, my personal experience, I was with a bank when the, when we went, when COVID started, and it kind of like, it brought forward years and years of things that we will do later, and like, you know, it's like hygiene that we will fix sometime later. I remember this specifically with, with Zoom, right? I mean, overnight, hundreds of thousands of people moved from whatever you know tools that they used to just onboard to zoom and this became a new reality um so you know you're right that we slow down in some areas but in some respect the the challenges have just yep. been you know like put on the table and in front of decision makers which helps uh which no, helps with long-term planning right no absolutely prioritization is always going to be key but this is pushed us like you're saying this you know everyone says you know like developers say put, put it in the backlog we'll do it we'll come to it later on our yeah, way no, of working was now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with this with covid it's pushed this to say actually this concept of remote working let's not do it in two years let's do it now because we we've got no choice but let's learn and, and evolve to it right so there are better ways of working now we are putting processes in place we're trying to remove zoom fatigue which is what, what our team sort of call it at the moment because you're on zoom as opposed to just being able to talk to somebody you know, everyone's organizing formal meetings. But yeah, it's a, it's a change in mentality as well from working as well as obviously there's lots of adoption that we still got to do. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Raj. I mean, in the context of fatigue, I want to <laughs> wrap it up. And, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and move back to, to Laurie. Thanks very much for the for these, Raj. No problem. Thanks, Laurie. Back to you. All right. Th thank you both. Thank, thank you very much, Raj. Really great presentation. Um, and I think something that really caught my attention there was when you were talking about you know, the need to break down monoliths in an extremely large banking group. 
with a pandemic going on and having to keep the lights on and you know improve the security posture trying to do all that at once it's very it's all very well conceptually talking about zero trust but actually getting into the the, the nuts and bolts of how and when it's implemented is incredibly important um now on to another institution who looks after our money hopefully maybe for a little bit later on in life but a very large and uh, and complex uh, government department department of work and pensions we have chris story uh, up next to, to give us his uh, perspectives on zero trust we can see your screen chris i think you're just on mute Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so um, today I want to talk about um, what we did with uh, Vault. Um, it's been a, a bit of a journey. Um, so some of this will be about um, how we, we went on this journey and then uh, wrapping up at the end is sort of what we've done um, more recently and, and where we're heading in the future. Um, so I'm Chris Storey, um, a tech lead uh, in Universal Credit uh, and um, more recently, I uh, also have responsibility for the Kickstart program, which um, you, some of you might know is uh, part of our COVID uh, response to getting young people back to work. Um, so, um, you know, I think we're talking to a, a UK audience mainly, but um, Department for Work and Pensions, um, yep, we're one of the largest uh, public um, sector organisations in the country. Um, it's always between us and the revenue as to who's um, bigger, uh, but we're both essentially banking organisations. One takes money in and one gives it out. Um, so giving it out, um, we give it out for uh, welfare purposes. Um, as, as said, later life pensions, which is probably touches just about everybody in the country. Um, and also we get involved in all sorts of other things like ch child maintenance. Um, so, you know, where, where relationships aren't working well, we can uh, help move money around for people. Um, we are, like all uh, government, uh, trying to be uh, digital by default, default. Um, but our services are, are sort of touching about 20 million people um, every, it's probably monthly. Some people don't use them that much, but the services behind them are there running for all of them as well. Um, the bit of DWP I work for um, is Universal Credit. Um, the background to the, the programme is we're trying to take six legacy benefits and uh, bring them together to be one monthly payment. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that um, back at when the beginning of COVID hit, um, we were just sort of teetering about the 3 million mark. Um, that rapid increase, um, we're now double that and we've got about 6 million um, claimants. Um, so, <laughs> sod's law in I think that's probably somebody telling me that my NatWest payments have gone wrong, even though I'm not a NatWest customer. And um, so um, the things we do deal with in Leeds um, are generally uh, supporting services, things that the claimant might not directly see, um, but things that do things like rent payments to help people out and, and all sorts of um, things in and about the service. So we need to go back to the beginning and work out why do we need Vault. So when we first started, we were very small. We were essentially one delivery team uh, with one DevOps, and we were managing things all uh, manually. Uh, that was secrets, that was certificates. Uh, release processes were quite quite manual, quite clunky. Um, we were using Puppet. There was Ansible in there. There was all sorts of different config management tools. Um, and um, some of the things we realized were becoming quite dangerous as we grew. So we, we had an integration uh, with Starling Bank for a while um, to pay pennies to people. But when you stand back from it, you go, well, actually, we've now got, we've now got things that are essentially signing checks and paying money. Um, but the way that we were handling that just was, it was just so clunky and un un unwieldy that um, it was just wrong. Um, and then I'll, Ultimately, the service that, that we're actually serving also contain personal data in, you know, either in large amounts or we try and keep things uh, quite slim with regards to particular services. But there was still personal data around. 
Um, we knew that our team was getting bigger. Uh, we knew that our team was becoming more diverse um, and that we were starting to get to that point where people had too much control. Um, we had um, individuals who were very, very instrumental to our process. Um, and equally, um, we had taken things away from the product teams, um, not, not, in, uh, not through any intent, but the product teams didn't have control of their own product. Um, and we felt that, you know, if somebody's got a key to do something with a bank, it's not something that should be part of an operations team. It should actually be something that's part of that product team. Um, so ultimately, stuff was getting messy, I think is the easiest way to describe it. So moving forward, what did we want to sort of first achieve? So in reality, we just wanted to up our game. Um, we, it wasn't that we were doing a bad job. We just could do better. Um, we wanted to make sure that anything we had was secure. We wanted to make sure that no one person had full control. Um, and that meant that anything we did had to be designed from that, that at the start. Um, it wasn't just going to be a, a thing that we layered on later. Um, ownership of secrets, we want to push to the right people. We wanted automation of all of the um, mutual TLS certificates that were floating about. Um, and whatever we did, we want to automate and standardize so that as we grew, a new team would come along and we wouldn't need to reinvent the wheel. We would just be able to pick it up. Um, we went out to look at the market and we looked at um, a number of different things. So, so some of the things were vendor specific. Uh, some of the things were uh, open source, but then based on, uh, you know, underlying vendor tooling as well. So, um, and some things were, uh, would only fit one part of our, our problem. So we looked around, we knew we had Vault elsewhere um, in, in UC, um, but we, we took it on um, in a sort of a different rate, I think, in the Leeds team. Um, but we took it on for a number of reasons. And one was the potential for growth, um, the ability to um, stretch across multiple cloud providers, because at the time we were particularly being asked to look to Azure rather than just AWS. We wanted to be multi-cloud. Um, and also that with it being open source, we could start small. And then as we've done, we've taken on the enterprise tooling um, over time um, and got now got the, enterprise, the depth of that enterprise support. But originally we were out there on our own with the, uh, the open source uh, uh, product. So our solution um, was very, very sort of, I guess, uh, simple in the sense that we built um, a cluster uh, across multiple availability zones, all in AWS, um, and we used console as the back end to store the secrets. Um, that was the pattern then. Um, we built it blue green so we could uh, flip, uh, so we could do releases. It was all built from the ground up with uh, Terraform. Um, and like all of the things that we build, we try and make a, as immutable as possible at all layers. Um, and we are always aiming to be able to do a, a zero downtime deploy. Um, we're building all of our apps like that. So anything we did in this space, we would want to be the same. So, so you know, things that are servicing um, the applications should all be able to be um, deployed in that, in that sort of fashion. Um, so off we went, um, one of our DevOps, Aaron, um, who's um, been involved in these talks before, um, was, uh, was key to this. He was absolutely amazing. He just took this thing and he researched every single piece. Um, and in doing so, we've, we've built, quite honestly, we, we followed the instructions with HashiCorp. There were some things we had a chat with uh, Nico about and said, look, um, we're going to do this. Uh, we went back and said, look, we've done our performance tests. We've proven that we don't need the size of those boxes for what we're doing. Um, but everything else, yeah, we're following, we're following the guidance. Um, we added extra things. So some, for instance, in parts of those um, bullets to the, the bottom of there, you'll see that the root tokens are destroyed. So our, in, our, our root, um, sorry, our build scripts um, managed getting rid of the root token. So no human has ever had the root token and therefore we can always uh, be assured that that has that process has, has taken place uh, nicely um, as the builds have gone on 
Um, all we wanted to do all the way through this was to make sure that nobody could ever be said as to, ah, yes, but when they built it, they had access to dot, 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 so therefore they could be, um, that we, we could then um, need to investigate something later on. So we tried to get rid of it all right from the start. So did we achieve it? Um, yeah, I think we did. Um, we, we're now in a position where all of the teams are um, using it for secrets, um, but we also use vaults uh, for config. Um, we took a decision early on that if you're going to if you're going to train somebody to do something, um, the least number of things that they need to learn about, the better. Um, and if we're going to store secrets, we could store config in the same place because there's this sort of blurring of which config actually do we need to keep quiet about, um, which config do we need really good uh, control over. So we we just handle at the moment as all secrets are config, or oh, sorry, all config is secrets. Um, as we move now, they can all do their own releases. Um, we've taken load off of our central team. That doesn't mean to say they're not doing anything because they're now on further development of, of the platform. Um, the staff have, uh, we, we very, very rarely, touching wood, uh, have any turnover in that team. Um, the team are um, doing interesting things like bringing this in, which is, um, I think helped really retain them and um, you know, some of the conversations they've had with Apache staff and things have uh, um, sort of just kept them going. Um, the quote at the bottom around um, about being able to do um, things and basically have control of things themselves um, was tantamount to this. And that this is what we aimed for. The product owners are now in control. The product owners are now managing the secrets. These are all things that um, they never thought they would do. We've had product owners saying they like doing releases and they'd like to be involved. Um, and I think that's a, a, a good place to be where technology and product are actually working, working well together. So as we've moved on, um, you know, today now, um, if we look back, would we have seen where we are now? I'm not sure, but certainly Vault is right at the heart of how we're managing our secrets. It's heart of how we manage our config. Um, we're now moving to not th to things being uh, ephemeral, uh, very short lived where possible. Um, times are getting shorter. And as we, we roll out more, as we um, come on to in a minute, um, you know, the rest of the platform is making much better use of, of, of Vault. It's not just a static thing on its own. On its own. Um, the, the use of Vault um, has grown. Um, we're quite a, um, a Conway's Law organization in a way, um, and it's always hard to get people to work together. And, you know, we've, we've, we, we've got a vault um, and other people are now wanting to use it and they're seeing that as really good value. Will it be a shared service? Will our vault be the shared service? I don't think so. But um, what I think what is happening is we're now got other people using ours for when they are making, um, when, they're, when they're interacting with us. And that's starting to be really good. People are seeing how useful a tool it is and they're then wanting to go on and use that. Um, we um, are now in the process of, um, well, we're up, we've, we've just upgraded. So uh, we've got a couple running at the moment, but the, the latest version we're running uh, has now brought the internal storage in play. Uh, so we've lost console for the purposes of that, but um, we're now, um, we've still got console in there because we're using that for service discovery and, and uh, we'll come on to things in a minute. Um, and um, we're now sort of taking it to the next step and we are uh, redesigning privileged user management um, across uh, all parts of UC to being very much more uh, what you know, this, this talk is all about and this whole zero trust model. But again, it's Vault at the heart of that. Um, we're using a product um, that uh, I believe is in the public domain now uh, called uh, Big Chief, um, which is probably going to be open sourced by NCSC um, to do some of that, um, the sort of user side of the uh, privileged user management authorization. So not the actual generation of tokens, but the how do you how do you sort of manage the Jira ticket in inverted commas around. Um, 
And also we're using a product called Keycloak, which is uh, part of Red Hat, um, independently open sourced for a lot of our other um, uh, authentication, authorization, um, sort of user aspects. Um, so that's becoming a big, big key. And that is now being packaged up and a whole team is looking after that, um, which is for us is, is really exciting. But ultimately, it all started with our, our work on Vault. And then parallel to that, um, we've got a load of ECS clusters. Um, uh, we, we were containerized from the start. And those ECS clusters were now starting to move across into to being controlled by Nomad. Um, because of the reliance on uh, a, a particular vendor, a particular vendor scheduler, by using Nomad, it will mean that we would be able to be more multi-cloud. Um, and and the, the small um, bits of stuff that we're putting into prod with Nomad, we are we are really liking, and we're really seeing where that's going. So as a um, a collective, it, it's it's looking good. So just to wrap up the journey, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, it's uh, I don't think we would uh, envisage being where we are now. Um, we, it's been a, uh, the, the teams have got behind it. If the team hadn't got behind it, it would have been so much more difficult. At times, some of the team aren't really seeing the bigger vision because it's so hard to describe to some people. But um, when you try and bring it down to, look, we're trying to safeguard you against yourself. So if something goes wrong, then we can try and, you know, take you out of the equation, they start to get that. There have been some occasional heart stopping moments. Um, but, uh, you know, we've we've had evenings where some people have ended up having to go and get the open source uh, code out uh, to try and work out how the hell we were going to deal with this. Meanwhile, Hashi's trying to do it, this, do the same. Um, but um, ultimately, um, you learn the errors that you you had in your ways, and then you just seek to not do that again. You know, if you don't um, if you don't upgrade exactly on at the right time, then sometimes you get caught out, which was that one. Um, but yeah, it, it it's been a an interesting journey. Would we have done it again? Of course we would. Um, and um, yeah, that's I think um, our our journey with Vault. Um, as I said, uh, please get anybody get in touch if you want to speak to us. Um, I've got Aaron's details there. Aaron did all the tech behind it. Aaron knows all about it. Um, I'll just put you on to Aaron. Um, he's the uh, he, he's the person behind uh, most of the uh, the actual delivery. Um, and as with everybody, we're always hiring. Um, all of our stuff's out there on uh, GitHub. Um, if anybody wants to have a look as well, uh, we've open sourced all, all of our builds. It's a little bit out of date, but um, it, it's all there. So um, over to you, Laurie. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris. A fantastic presentation. And um, as you rightly say, you know, this is a journey. Um, I think possibly people have a perception that government departments may not be the most innovative departments, but, you know, given that DWP has been using Vault for four years, you know, active proponent of open source, clearly integrating with other products, you know, looking at uh, strategy, um, you know, from a, from a, a very sort of in-depth level, uh, fantastic to see all of that, and also very pleased to hear that you're you know you're looking at uh, at other Hashicorp products as well, and and how you can implement those, whether they be you know the open source or the enterprise versions. So very much appreciate it, and uh, please do reach out to uh, Chris and all of the panelists as well if you do have uh, any additional supplementary questions. Um, we're now going to turn to the perspectives of uh, AWS with Siva Sadhu. Um, as many of you probably know, um, AWS is uh, um, you know, a very key technology partner of, of HashiCorp, clearly uh, a pioneer in the delivery of cloud services. Um, we have um, deep you know, joint engineering relationships with AWS, uh, and very often we have you know, day one releases of, of Terraform, for example, with the latest uh, AWS services. Um, also, in the last six months, uh, HashiCorp is now also available on the AWS marketplace. So um, we, we do a lot of business with, uh, with AWS as a key partner. Uh, Siva, over to you. Thanks, Ravi. Um, 
I uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Siva Sadhu, uh, a partner solutions architect at AWS. I work with ISV partners across the EMEA region. Thanks for having me today. So Guy has earlier defined what is zero trust security. Uh, let's look at some of the guiding principles uh, that can help guide us in this journey. The best security doesn't come from making a binary choice between identity-centric and network-centric tools, but rather by uh, using both effectively in combination with each other. Um, zero, trust, zero trust can mean different things in different contexts. Um, by focusing on a specific problem that we're trying to solve and approaching it with fresh eyes and new tools, we can avoid getting mired in low-value discussions around whether a new approach to a security challenge is really, or, or to what degree it is, an application of the zero trust concept. A uh, third guiding principle is that zero trust concepts must be applied in accordance with the organizational value of the system and data being protected. We believe it's best to think of zero trust concepts as additive to existing security controls and concepts rather than as replacements. Let's explore into how AWS has woven some of these principles into the fabric of AWS. The most prominent example of zero trust in AWS is how millions of customers typically interact with AWS every day using the AWS Management Console or securely calling AWS APIs over a diverse set of public and private networks. Whether called via the console, the AWS Command Run Interface, or software written to the AWS APIs, ultimately all of these methods of interaction reach a set of web services with endpoints that are reachable from the internet. There's absolutely nothing about the security of the AWS API infrastructure that depends on network reachability. Each one of these signed API requests is authenticated and authorized every single time at rates of millions upon millions of requests per second globally. Our customers do so confidently, knowing that the cryptographic strength of the underlying transport layer security protocol, augmented by the AWS signature v4 signing process, properly secures this request without any regard to the trustworthiness of the underlying network. Interestingly, the use of cloud-based APIs is rarely, if ever, mentioned in zero trust discussions. Perhaps this is because AWS led the way with this approach to securing APIs from the start, such that it is now assumed to be a basic part of every cloud security story. Similarly, but perhaps not as well understood, when individual AWS services need to call each other to operate and deliver their service capabilities, they rely on the same mechanisms that you use as a customer. You can see this in action in the form of service link tools. For example, when AWS Autoscaling determines that it needs to call the Amazon EC2 API to create or terminate an EC2 instance in your account, the Autoscaling service assumes the service link role you've provided in your account, receives the resulting AWS short-term credentials and uses these credentials to sign requests using the SIG v4 process to the appropriate EC2 APIs. On the receiving end, AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM, authenticates and authorizes the incoming calls for EC2. In other words, even though they are both AWS services, AWS autoscaling and EC2 have no inherent trust, network or otherwise, of one another. And they use strong identity identity-centric controls as the basis of the security model between the two services as they operate on your behalf. You, the customer, have full visibility into both the privileges that you're granting to one service, as well as an AWS cloud trail record of the use of those privileges. Other great examples of zero trust capabilities in the AWS portfolio can be found in the IoT service. When we launched AWS IoT Core, we made a strategic decision against the prevailing industry norms at the time to always require TLS network encryption and modern client authentication, including certificate-based mutual TLS when connecting IoT devices to service endpoints. In the case where you need to connect to broader AWS services outside the IoT family, we included mechanisms to do trusted credential exchange you could exchange your certificate for AWS short-term credentials that are necessary to do the signature v4 process that we have been talking about. We subsequently added TLS support to free RTOS, enabling modern secure communication to an entire class of CPU and small memory devices that were previously assumed to not be capable of it. 
With AWS IoT Green Glass, we pioneered a way of working with existing no security devices using a remote gateway that relied on local network presence, but was also able to run AWS Lambda functions to validate security and provide a secure proxy to the cloud. These examples highlight where adherence to AWS security standards brought key foundational components of zero trust to a technology domain where vast amounts of unauthenticated, unencrypted network messaging over the open internet was previously the norm. Now let's look at how AWS can help you on your own cloud zero trust journey. We will talk about three distinct use cases as a backdrop. The first use case we're going to look at mainly is on machine to machine communications, authorizing specific flows between components to help eliminate lateral network mobility risk. This greatly reduces the overall surface area of the connected systems and eliminates unneeded pathways, particularly those that lead to sensitive data. And the consideration here as we see today is sometimes these patterns follow architectures. So let us uh, look here at a simple scenario. We've got our employee application and this discussion about unneeded lateral mobility through the network, it has to start with security groups. Security groups are really awesome, uh, highly dynamic software defined micro perimeter that does a great job of constraining both north, south and east, west traffic. But beyond that, they have some really interesting properties. They have this notion of group membership. The flows between components aren't specified by saying this thing, they are specified by saying this group is allowed to talk to this other group. So as infrastructure comes and goes for the sake of auto scaling or other things, the rules that define these network flows automatically adjust around the various components. And as we put down per application, per component security groups, we are able to just easily say how information should flow through an application. So if we haven't specified a flow to be allowed across applications or within an application, it will naturally be denied. Now, if that's the first version of micro perimeters, I think the other great perimeter to bring in here are services like private ring. Imagine now my application needs to connect to some other services that I've built within my cloud environment, uh, but here I've built them in totally independent AWS accounts, in totally different VPCs with no routing and no connectivity between the two. I can use services like private ring to drop an ENI or elastic network interface into my local VPC, and that's going to build this narrow one-way gateway through this fabric of AWS to essentially be able to connect a service on the remote end and make it appear locally. Again, all of that is programmable. It's, it's a very dynamic layer for networking. And on top of that, I might do layer seven identity techniques like mutual TLS, like OAuth to maybe even a combination of the both. Now I can do that for services that I've built. I can also do that for third-party services, be it monitoring services, database services. This is really a flexible way for essentially extending and connecting in things from very far off disparate networks without worrying about routing and connectivity. And when things don't need to talk to one another, there is no path to secure because there's not a path at all. I think that's a really powerful thing to bring to bear as we are building these architectures. So our second use case is all about friction-free access to internal apps. And this is one very prominent in zero trust circles. We are trying to get a human user access to generally an internal application from anywhere. Our goal is about mobility. Our goal is about making it so that the employee can work anywhere. We want to do so, but we also don't want to compromise on security. We arguably want to improve security as we are going about this. Before we dive into architectures, I really submit to you that this is not a one size fits all scenario. You've got to choose the architecture that makes sense for your workforce, whether they have corporate devices or not, your developer fluency, your regulatory domain. I think this is just clearly not a one size fits all scenario. So the first way that AWS might help you solve this is with a service workspaces. We are going to look at two architectures. Uh, we've got that internal application and in the same employee directory app, it is running in a private subnet. 
I'm going to spin up a virtual desktop in AWS and I'm going to take that remote user that's working from home. I'm going to allow them to connect. They're going to authenticate through an authentication and session gateway. We are going to use directory services to go back to the corporate directory, active directory or otherwise, and strongly authenticate the user. And then after I do, we are going to use technologies like PC over IP to essentially push pixels to the user. The takeaway here is that all of your applications and data stay within AWS. What really goes out to the user is a perfectly useful, perfectly interactive form of that, but it's just pixels. The data never leaves the secure and claim. Now, there are other ways to solve this, though again, depending on a lot of nuances of your environment, but this is certainly um, maybe one of the most prevalent zero trust use cases there. And so here we really do want to stick our trusty employee directory application straight on the internet. So we are going to take a trifecta approach. We are going to take services like AWS Shield, AWS WAF, an application load balancer with OpenID Connect authentication enabled. And as we do so, that allows those edge services give us protection from the craziness of the internet. We go through that application word balancer, which you already needed as part of your app. It detects that I haven't been yet authenticated. It is going to redirect the user to the OIDC compliant identity provider of your choice. That's going to do all that uh, strong and adaptive authentication, device posture, geolocation, and all those sorts of things. The takeaway here again is that from your user's perspective, you made with this architecture, your internal applications just as flexible as your SaaS applications. It, it's, it's a SaaS-like experience for you, the security team, you've got managed protection, shield, WAF, ALB, things you don't have to patch, you don't have to operate. AWS has encoded the security into these services. And then as the application on the backend, you get two things. One is get you get assurance that the only traffic that's getting through that friend door has been strongly authenticated. And then you get an upgrade to a modern authentication literally with almost no changes at all. A third use case, this is one where I think the great example is the IoT enabled wind turbine out in the middle of nowhere using a small microcontroller to beam data and instrumentation to the cloud over arguably the world's most untrusted, untrustworthy network, the internet. The security model here, obviously it comes into zero trust conversations because that exists totally outside the network perimeter as it's ever existed. And so we clearly need a new model, whether that's applicable to your business or not today, I'd offer to you that it's important to get ahead of it because we continue to see how essential those sorts of workloads are to business and product innovation going forward. In the interest of time, we're not going to dive super deep into this one because it largely mirrors the AWS IoT security architectures and patterns. So please check that out if that's of interest. With this, I hope uh, I have effectively communicated our vision for Zero Trust and highlighted how we believe that our underlying security principles and advancing capabilities represent a bar raising security model, both for the AWS cloud and for the environments that our customers build on top of our services. At Amazon, we obsess over customers and the needs, so our job is never done. We have lots more capabilities we want to build and lots more guidance still to offer. We look forward to continuing the journey together, reflecting the words and core vision of our founder, Jeff Bezos, it's still day one. Thanks for your time and attention. Have a great day. Over to you, Ravi. Simon, thank you very much indeed for AWS's perspective on, on Zero Trust and for the great examples and architecture diagrams you showed us there. It's still day one. I think it's still day one for, for all of us on this uh, on this webinar. Lots of learnings to do. Uh, and, you know, many of us still kind of scratching the surface and I'm excited to get to a Zero Trust world. Um, as our final speaker today, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, EMEA's Head of Field Engineering at uh, HashiCorp, Nico Correo. Uh, Nico? Take it away. Thanks, Laurie. And uh, thanks everyone for powering through. I know we're running a little bit late, so I'll try to keep it as um, concise as possible. And I hope you can all hear, uh, you can all hear me and you can all uh, see my screen. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of detail in terms of what we have delivered in terms of, you know, helping you get to zero trust and what we, what's coming 
uh, later in the year, but just reviewing a couple of principles. The things top of mind for us and, and around you know, some of the concepts that um, Guy has shared with you is, is this set of principles in terms of giving every user or every application the least privilege possible so we ensure everything is capped to the right level of access. Never to trust anything. We cannot trust an application if it's based on this parameter. We always have to verify. And you know, we have to assume an offensive posture at all times. We have to assume that our network might have been compromised. We have to assume that everyone outside might not have a positive intent in interacting with applications. And in that sense, you know, we need to constantly have these this offensive um, posture. We were joking with Guy where, where you know we were going through some of this material, and Guy started was telling telling him, you know, it's it's not nice to trust to not trust people, but unfortunately, this is the world of the internet we live in, right? And if we're developing, you know. Uh, Applications that handle banking or handle the benefit system for the whole of the UK, you know, we have to always uh, take an offensive uh, position. And that those were just of the the examples of Chris and Raj, who you know, unfortunately, I haven't seen in a year because we've been all locked on home. Um, what we have done over the past five years, which is pretty much my history in in HashiCorp, is deliver services that are able uh, that, that enable you to effectively. Um, do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this project. I'm going to talk about what's coming, but let me start a little bit, you know, in terms of that that sort of machine to machine authorization and, and what we have achieved with Bolt. Um, Bolt has is is quickly becoming a staple for uh, most organizations that are um, deploying applications in a zero trust environment through a very simple principle, which is you know we need to broker access between applications. And we apply that same logic for ourselves. If you are a Vault user, you know that you can request access to other HashiCorp systems through HashiCorp Vault. Uh, them I know, I wrote some of them. But effectively, as, as Vault has you know, sort of increased maturity and has captured a, a considerable amount of the, the ecosystem in terms of brokering access, we try to push a little bit forward with Vault in terms of, okay, maybe it's not just access from application to application, but Vault should actually take a more offensive posture when it comes to securing data. And what you have seen probably in the last couple of years is, is shipping a very interesting um, feature set that, that started very simply with Transit. The idea that you know, um, you know, we we introduce a separation of concern between who holds keys to store information and which application get access to decrypted information without uh, effectively having access to keys. Okay, and Transit has been traditionally very simple. We supported a, a subset of algorithms and keys and, and complexities where you know you have information, you need to encrypt it in a consistent way. You can separate that concern by virtue of um, you know provisioning the keys, maintaining those keys involved, and storing um, that information elsewhere, and just controlling through policy and of course you know uh, after through audit who get access to that information. As you can see in this clear example, an application can receive input from a user which has uh, you know uh, PII or, or sensitive data. And Vault will return encrypted versions of, of these information that are persisted at rest. Now, of course, that would work in, in a number of very modern applications, but you know, A, this is not the only regulatory requirements we have, and B, you know, we don't live in a world where we just interact with you know something like Dynamo or we just interact with you know a number of unstructured um, you know databases or systems of record. So it was very important to us to start shaping in Vault actually workflows that allow to support that. And the first thing that was sort of a common staple is from a regulatory perspective, you know, information can be stored in transit or not, but information definitely needs to be encrypted at rest. So we introduced the possibility involved of actually interfacing with a number of these systems um, in terms of sort of holding the trust of those keys and just making making them accessible to systems so they can encrypt information transparently from the user. In that way, a user and application can go and retrieve information transparently, but the information is uh, encrypted when it hits um, disk. And we do that through the introduction of the KMIP uh, protocol, which is a, a subset of, o of OASIS that is very well known, and it's used in systems like VMware or MongoDB uh, or PostgreSQL, MySQL, and, and, and a number of you know, wide, you know, widely commercially available uh, products that, that basically store um, information. 
But that is sort of not enough because as we are working with potentially these constraints around, if you're all familiar with RDBMSs, you know that you will have limitations when it comes to storing data. You cannot just take a base 64 encrypted value and store it in a field that must be a varchar of a particular set of characters or must you know just accept integers. So we started looking in terms of how to preserve that format when we receive a value, but also obfuscating in a way where in transit and at rest, um, you know, it's not immediately recognizable. And that's why we introduced um, format preserving encryption using, um, you know, uh, FFS3-1, which is an NIST approved protocol, plus a, a dictionary that you would provide for those transformations, if you will. But another very common workflow is where we have to accept sensitive data, like let's say a credit card, but for, you know, for improving the user experience at the time of potentially making a payment, you need to give that user a little bit to identify which credit card um, you are using. Uh, and that's why we introduced masking as an R transformation, which is completely non-reversible, but effectively allows an application to say, okay, this mask data I can store in a certain privilege level, but um, these other, um, you know, this other bit of data actually must go into, let's say the PCI, um, segment of um, my network. Moving forward, and most recently, we looked into introducing tokenization. And you, you may tell me there are, you know, this, this certainly seemed like very subtle differences, but there are very important use cases for each. You know, and, and a great example of tokenization is something that we are also discussing with a number of um, government entities around potentially medical data or even tax data, where there is a lot of processing that need to be done by a number of systems, potentially in a message queue, where at the start and the end of the process, I actually need to sort of individualize who these records belong to, but throughout the middle, I don't want those systems to get access because if they get compromised, you know, we are leaking PII data. So in this sense, what we can do with tokenization is effectively provide a token that is completely non-reversible, i.e. I cannot derive the original data from the token um, to the point that I actually have to keep a mapping. And that's what, what Vault is providing you. It's going to encrypt the data while stored and providing you a non-reversible token that you can use um, throughout your processing and then you know, go back to that mapping um, whenever you um, need to. But moving forward in the future, there is more. There is a lot more. And as we all know, if we are um, using a number of sort of um, offerings from the likes of AWS or the likes of Azure, you know they will, you know, they will integrate with their own key management systems. Potentially they are not using KME because they have actually excellent products to maintain that cryptography. We need to retain uh, control of that key material. And that is something that has been asked um, from us in terms of part of our, our securing data strategy. How do we bring our own key? How do we maintain those keys that are in KMS in multiple accounts, for example, or in Azure Key Vault? And effectively bringing your own key is one of the workflows that we have invested a lot in over the past uh, quarter. Uh, we just uh, shipped this. So if you, if you have a need for this, I would you know <laughs> greatly encourage you uh, to try it because it's an excellent way to maintain consistency around the distribution of your um, key material. Moving forward, there is more. Um, you probably all seen one of the mandates in terms of US government um, very recently, which was, uh, you know, we need, you know, the, the, US, the US federal government needs to adopt a zero trust, uh, you know, um, position when it comes to securing data. We have over the past provide a seal wrap and um, you know uh, a way of uh, storing data in a manner compliant with FIPS, but we are getting demanded more. We're, you know because a the regulatory uh, framework change and it's now FIPS 140-3, so we need to ensure we maintain compliant, and we need to make sure that potentially we provide as the regulatory uh, framework um, has evolved uh, a CMBP. Uh, in software that is complying with FIPS. And this is where we're going in the future in terms of, you know, how do we ensure that in perpetuity, your data is protected, not only really protected, but also regulatory protected, which tends to be uh, an interesting distinction. Moving forward, we talk a little bit about sort of the machine to machine transport and how we're looking into um, really creating that 
offensive posture in the network while maintaining while, while creating something that is ultimately maintainable you know any of us that have maintained firewalls you know that firewall rules tend to be you know append only where we keep adding ips and you know uh, just because of concern separation of concerns uh, you know, I've managed firewalls and more than once I've asked myself, like, you know, who is this IP? What is it doing? Does it still need to be on the list? Cloud just exacerbated um, the problem. So console sort of was designed with that in mind, first from a discovery perspective, as Chris was mentioning, in terms of what they're using, but then into an actual mesh. And how do we transcend the traditional IP concepts in order to give you know um, system to system um, access in a way that is recognizable, in a way where a service name actually is more meaningful than an IP address, and since we are routing the traffic, how do we provide observability in that traffic? How do we extract header information or response information in a way where we can do statistical analysis without actually going into the depth of the application and potentially compromising um, data? Now, as we all know, um, the, the concept of sort of ingress and egress has been traditionally what has been dictating us. We've created perimeters when we create one door in and um, one door out. And those doors are generally controlled outside your platform. They are controlled by firewalls. They are controlled by other systems. There is a tight integration required within, within these platforms. And we have severely recognized the issue. And this is going to be a considerable investment for us moving forward. We're already shipping some of this. And you may see some of this in beta. But our big challenge is if we have this mesh, how do we interact with the other meshes? How do we interact with the traditional networks? And how console becomes ultimately, um, you know, the single control plane for all your networks? And our sort of imminent investment on this um, is something that you probably have already seen that has come out, you know, days or weeks ago, um, which is our capabilities around network infrastructure automation. Considering that our products already have deep integrations into um, the systems and we have Terraform providers, you know, we have introduced the console Terraform sync service as a way to provide the same dynamic configuration ability to a range of, um, you know, firewall products and load balancing products um, in a way where we don't have to integrate with each other individually because guess what? We already integrate with them through on our product and this is pretty much uh, if, if you if you have been working with hashcorp uh, for a while our ethos right we don't want to reinvent the wheel we want to leverage what we already have and console terraform sync is a great example of that and the idea about this is is literally to drive that productivity i've i've been on both sides of the fence and i know how frustrating sometimes is when you know potentially the context of your application is done is ready to go but there is always that one ticket there is always that one firewall that someone is managing manually. We're trying to create a, a, a workflow that enables um, to maintain those firewalls in a secure way, but also in a way that is sustainable from an operational perspective. And lastly, and I'm powering a little bit through because we're, you know, we're a little bit late. You may have heard of Boundary. Um, you know, Chris was talking about the, the efforts that the NCSE is doing with, with Big Chief. And we have been talking, uh, you know, I personally have been talking with the NCNC about that. It's, it's sort of a very interesting project. But looking into Boundary, we, you know, we are trying to solve that, you know, human to machine access problem. And what we shipped last year is, is, is very, very promising because it's not just, you know, the brokerage and it's not just getting the secret. It's more, it's looking at how do we establish a perimeter? How do we um, create a perimeter where we may not need VPNs? We can create dynamic tunnels in the same way we, did, we do with um, service mesh. As you can imagine, the, the sort of you know, steps that are missing from boundary as it exists today, which is you know, we have a secret, we can't create a work and we are, can't tunnel a connection to you, um, is pretty much that secret injection. And, you know, initially we're going to support Vault as allowing that transparent secret injection. So a user hops into Boundary, is going to automatically get secrets, um, you know, provisioned into the worker connection transparently in order to access a target system where everything is going to be audited. And of course, in the future, we're looking into 
adding more of the inspection features in the protocol to satisfy more regulatory requirements around potentially session recording, session login, session termination is something that we are going to implement rather imminently because guess what? We, th this is why we did the tunnels. So we have a full end-to-end -end control of the information flow. And look, folks, Zero Trust is, is a journey. As, as you all heard, you know, I've been talking to Chris for a couple of years. I, I've been talking to Raj um, also for a, a couple of years. But, you know, this is, this is ultimately what we're aiming to. Uh, we're aiming to a world where, you know, an application needs to access something, they get just-in-time credentials. And remember, just-in-time is the key here. Nothing should be long-lived. And uh, a user sends information to an application, that information can be encrypted, okay? And we get full control of who, en who encrypts and decrypts that information. We have, got, we have full traceability of the data. That application can connect to the database through a mesh that transparently introduces mutual TLS, so we don't have to worry about rotating certificates. And we do that through Envoy. That information has been already encrypted and that information is stored into the database. That database is also encrypted data at rest um, using KMIP. And when an administrator needs to manage this, it can hop on into Boundary and just in time get credentials and get access to manage every element of the application. So with that, and um, I, I rushed through a couple of things, uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for you know giving me a little bit of your time. And I'm going to pass it back to Lori. Nico, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for uh, staying with us, we're just uh, slightly over time. Um, Connor's just going to share one final, final slide uh, with us all, which is um, just for, for follow-ups. So uh, first and foremost, uh, you can download a HashiCorp's white paper uh, from our website, um, which is uh, entirely based on Zero Trust. Uh, our co-founder, Amon Dadgar, does a very good whiteboard video, which I think is very easy to, to explain uh, the, the concepts, which you can find uh, on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, and of course, all of the team at HashiCorp will be happy to follow up if you have any direct questions. Uh, today, we heard first and foremost from uh, Guy Sayer, uh, who talked us through uh, that, the high level principles of zero trust. We then heard an excellent presentation from, from Raj uh, Dessor from, um, from Matt West Group, who talked us through how they've attacked it, uh, how they've gone step by step, and a, and a fantastic private sector example. And then also we heard from Chris Story, who gave a great example of how Vault has been used to achieve a lot of the zero trust goals that um, uh, DWP were looking for. Great presentation as well from Siva Sadhu from, from AWS on how they perceive uh, zero trust, as well as some, some concrete examples of how um, things like wind turbines are leveraging uh, IT and AWS. And then finally, uh, Nico brought things together with uh, how Zero Trust and, and our product roadmap is, is aligning. Um, lots more webinars from, from Ashicorp to, to come. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, have a great afternoon.